Right. So this course is introducing Buddhism. It's, uh, you know, you don't have to know anything about Buddhism to do this course. But um, also, if you know something, as we uh, discussed at the beginning, you know, uh, you know, with Buddhism, you have to keep on revisiting and revisiting and revisiting the teachings. And so, you know, by, by doing that, um, you know, you gradually start building an understanding of it. Um, so, you know, we might have newcomers. We had someone who had done a correspondence course, someone who might have done a lot of practice. And it's, um, um, you know, useful for all, I hope. So Buddhism is a religion um, that was started, sorry, before I go into that, let me just uh, give you what the topics are going to be. And also I can just give you a few uh, books that if you wanted to read more, you can. So um, let me know if you can just put up the first slide. Okay, so the course consists of seven talks. Um, so today we'll be talking about what Buddhism is and Buddha's life story. Uh, then there is three signs of being and three fires next week, followed by the core teaching of Buddhism, four noble truths in the third week. And on the fourth week, we will in fact be talking about the fourth of the Four Noble Truths, which is the Noble Eightfold Path. Fifth week, uh, we'll be talking about Wheel of Life, Karma and Rebirth, which really explain why we feel um, certain things at a certain point in time, what, you know, it just doesn't ha ha happen randomly. Uh, you know, there are causes and conditions that bring it about. So we'll be talking about that. Um, and the sixth lesson is the parameters. And here I'll be talking about the development of Buddhism into a school called Mahayana school. And the last uh, uh, lesson is on meditation, which is one of the core practices of uh, Buddhism. Um, now, the, the uh, lessons are uh, every Tuesday at 6.30, except that there is no class on Tuesday, the 26th of October. So if you could try and remember that, um, uh, I will try and remind you nearer the time as well. Let me know if we can have the next slide. Also, um, if you registered for the course, uh, then you will be able to access my course notes. Uh, uh, you would have been sent login details if you've registered for the course. And uh, after every lesson, the course notes will be put on. And that in itself should be sufficient reading if you don't want to read any more. But if you did, then I got three books uh, here. Um, one is Living Buddhism by Venerable Mio Kioni. This is only available through the society and you can order it through the society website. The other book, uh, uh, the other two books are available from Amazon or you could search for any other bookseller that you uh, like or favor. Uh, so the Books are The Buddha's Ancient Path by Pia Dasi. And the third one is What the Buddha Taught by Walpole Rahula. That's a, uh, both of them are quite, um, you know, they've been written quite a few years ago and they're really good books. And they're in increasing um, sort of difficulty of, uh, uh, for reading. Uh, so Living Buddhism is very easy to read. So if you uh, just wanted to read one book out of the three, then I'd say get Living Buddhism uh, and you can order it from the society. Okay, so, um, okay, Lavinia, you can take the slide off or, or maybe leave it on in case anyone wants to note the titles of the books. Um, okay, so as I was saying, Buddhism is a religion that was started by Buddha Sakyamuni in India. 
And it arose from Buddha's quest to answer why we suffer and his discovery of the way out of suffering. Buddha was born as a prince um, approximately two and a half thousand years ago, and his father, uh, Suddhodana, ruled over a clan called Sakyans at Kapilvastu, which is on the borders between Nepal and India. And Buddha's mother was called Queen Maya. There is a custom which is still followed in India uh, that when a woman is pregnant, she actually goes to her paternal home to give birth. So it was when Queen Maya, when she was uh, pregnant with, uh, 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 with Buddha, uh, uh, when she was traveling from Kapilvastu, where the, uh, uh, where the kingdom uh, of Suddhodana was, to Devadaha, where Queen Maya's parental home was, it was during that journey that the child was born prematurely in a place called Lumbini. And very shortly after birth, Queen Maya died and her sister Mahaprajpati brought up the child as her own. Let me know if we can have the next slide. So, some of these places that I mentioned are actually, you know, we can actually visit this, uh, these places in India uh, and Nepal, and um, uh, they form a Buddhist uh, uh, pilgrimage circuit. And Lumbini is in, is in fact in Nepal, actually. So, uh, uh, let me know, we can uh, go, uh, you can uh, take the slide off. As was the custom of the time, the king summoned eight wise men to choose a name for the child and to tell the baby's future. So he was named Siddharth and his family name was Gautam. So he was Siddharth Gautam. And to clarify the name Buddha, means an awakened one. Um, so the name Buddha is used after his enlightenment. Till then, his Prince Siddharth Gautam. Now, the two wise men who were called to, do, to tell the baby's future said the, to the king that the child had one of two possible futures. Either the child would become a Chakravartin, which is a great world ruler, or the other possibility was that if he should renounce the world, he would become a fully enlightened Buddha who will lead countless beings to salvation. Now the king on hearing these two possible futures decided that the child should in fact inherit the kingdom and he should develop no idea whatsoever about wanting to leave home for, the, uh, for a homeless life of an ascetic to search for truth. And uh, so, so, and so as to make sure that the child remained in the worldly life, the king surrounded the prince with luxury and refinement uh, and so that the prince should want nothing more, that he should be la lacking nothing. And, you know, the king thought that with that, uh, the prince will be bound to the homely life, to the home life, rather than become an ascetic. The prince was married to a beautiful princess, Princess Yasodhara, and 
he had three palaces and lacked nothing. He lived amongst song and dance, luxury and pleasure, not knowing about sorrow. Yet all these efforts by the king to make sure that the prince uh, it does not look for uh, anything beyond being a prince really came to nothing because uh, on one occasion, the prince decided to go driving into town with his faithful charioteer. And up to this point, the prince had been protected from the ugly side of life. Um, so whenever he went out, you know, it was made sure that all the sights would be pleasant for him. Uh, but on this occasion, you know, the prince had sneaked out with his charioteer. And to his amazement, he saw what he had never seen before, which was an old man who was weakened and decrepit with age. And he turned to his charioteer and asked what sort of a person this was. And he was told that it's a case of aging and infirmity and that this fate awaited everyone. It awaited the, the prince, it awaited everyone whom he loved. And the prince was deeply disturbed by this. Now let's take a pause in the story. Um, Buddha's life story is not just a historical account. It's not like, you know, um, people have researched the history of Buddha and just written it down. It's also an allegorical account. It's, in other words, it's a teaching account. So some of these stories are actually making teaching points. And we've come across two, and I'll go through those two. Um, and also, um, we find in Buddha's life story some mythical accounts, sorry, mythological accounts in his uh, life story. And a lot of people, you know, get disturbed by this and say, you know, this can't be accurate. What's all this about? But actually, you know, mythological accounts are very useful uh, because, you know, sometimes when you give some deep truths in black and white, they don't, do not portray the real picture. Whereas, you know, when they are portrayed mythologically, it really builds a nice rounded picture. So, you know, we, we do come across some mythological accounts in Buddha's life story. And, you know, it, when we have time at the end, either today or some other day, I might recount one or two of these mythological um, aspects uh, to, to his life story. So what are the two points that we've come across so far in the life story? The first one is the king arranged and manipulated everything, all the circumstances that he could to ensure that the prince will be bound to the life of pleasure and be bound to the mundane everyday life uh, uh, in order to ensure that he will become a ruler. Yet, um, as, as we'll go on to discover uh, as the story goes on, you know, his efforts really came to nothing. And the point that is being made here is, you know, we might in our daily lives, you know, have a fondness for something, something that we find pleasurable, and we ma manipulate things and circumstances to bring that about. Uh, and it could be anything. It could be just uh, an object. It could be a relationship. Uh, it could be a big house, a lifestyle, and we manipulate things around. And, you know, sometimes they work and sometimes they do not work because there's something greater at play beyond what we can plan and decide. So that's one point that's been made. The other point that's being made is... If we really think about this, you know, the prince was being made to be a world ruler. It's hardly uh, possible that he did not know about such a thing as old age. I mean, how could someone become a ruler if he does not know that people age? 
and become infirm perhaps even and, and even die. But the point that perhaps we can take away from here is it's one thing knowing all these things theoretically is one thing, you know, we hear in news about people going through all sorts of suffering in the world. You know, there are wars going on in the world, people in really dire circumstances. And, you know, we, we might, um, you know, feel sorry for them, but, you know, it does not have the same impact until, uh, unless we were going through the same thing. Um, and the Buddhist practice is, not, uh, is therefore not just about studying the teachings, it, the, the pra- it is also about practice. And the practice brings us face to face with all our difficulties, with all our suffering. So that's a valuable point being made here. So, you know, the prince, might have known about death, but it was quite another, sorry, might have known about uh, old age, but it was quite another thing when he came across the old man. So to carry on with the story, the prince made two further trips with his charioteer. On the first of these two subsequent trips, he saw a sick man unable to walk, crying in pain and anguish. And on the next trip, he saw a corpse being taken for cremation. And each time he was told by Chana, his faithful charioteer, that the fate of old age, sickness and death awaited everyone. And Buddha got more and more disturbed about life's suffering. Buddha went out once again with the charioteer and this on this trip he saw a mendicant and he learned from Chana that this recluse had abandoned home life to live a life of purity and to seek for the truth. And on seeing this, Buddha realized that the true happiness did not lie in the pleasures of the palace. And like the mendicant, he resolved to leave, to live, to leave the palace and live a homeless life and search for the truth. Uh, as to why we suffer. So, you know, old age, sickness, and death, we, we can take as shorthand for suffering. So the result to find out why there is old age, sickness, and death, why there is suffering, and the way, and liberation from that, liberation from old age, sickness, and death. So at the age of 29, On the day that his wife had given birth to his son Rahul, uh, the prince left in hermit's robes. He found two well-respected teachers, one after the other. He learned all that each teacher had to teach, reaching heights of meditation, but the teacher's teaching and meditation did not actually reveal the answers that that he was seeking as to why we suffer and what the way out of suffering is. And having attained proficiency under each teacher, each had in turn invited uh, uh, Gautam to join them as teacher, but Gautam declined for, you know, the teachers had taught him all they could and he still had not found the answers he was searching for. So he decided to leave. He paid his respects to, to the teachers um, and he left on his search. Now there was, and there still is in India, 
belief among many ascetics that the final liberation can only be achieved by self-mortification and through hardship. So Siddharth actually found five ascetics who were following this path and he decided to join them. And Siddharth was firm in his practice. He lived on a few grains of rice, wore rags, um, slept on hard ground and suffered all sorts of hardships. And he suffered for several years like this and he became like a skeleton and came near death. And he realized that the path of self-mortification would simply result in his death without him having found the answer to his search. In other words, why we suffer and what the way out of suffering is. So it, it would have been fruitless following that path. Uh, Lavinia, if we, if we can have the next slide. Yes, so this is on the pilgrimage route as well. And this is the cave where the Buddha practiced his austerities. And there is a Buddha Rupa there. Buddha Rupa means a statue of the Buddha. And that Buddha Rupa is showing Buddha, um, you know, when he had starved and there are ribs actually coming through. And it is said that um, the Buddha could actually get hold of his spine when he put his hand to the front uh, on the tummy. So, you know, that's how far he had, he had gone with his uh, starvation. Okay, Lavinia, we can um, uh, remove that slide. Um, so, Gautam abandoned self-torture uh, because he realized, you know, it's going to be fruitless. And he started so, so he started taking normal food and he, and he took a bathe in a river, which as an ascetic, you know, it was con considered to be a luxury and he had not done. Now his five companions saw this and they decided that Gautam had given up his struggle for enlightenment and had taken to a life of luxury. So they left him. Gotham on uh, taking normal food and abandoning self-torture regained his former strength. And the Bodhisattva, now the Bodhisattva, the term Bodhisattva means one who aspires to enlightenment. So we can call uh, Buddha at this stage of his life uh, Bodhisattva. So the Bodhisattva resolved to make his final search by his own strength and efforts in complete solitude. So in the forenoon of the day before his enlightenment, while the Bodhisattva was seated under a banyan tree, Sujata, a daughter of a rich householder, offered him some rice gruel, and this was his last meal prior to his enlightenment. And then the Buddha sat cross-legged in meditation under Bodhi tree and resolved not to get up till he had attained full enlightenment. And as the night drew on, the Bodhisattva entered successive stages of meditation and on reaching the fourth and the highest stage of meditation, profound insights unfolded. And on seeing the morning star, the Bodhisattva became enlightened. And he can now be referred to the Buddha as the fully awakened one. So when he became enlightened, it means that he found the answer to why we suffer and also the way 
out of suffering. So that's what enlightenment is. Lavinia, if we can have fifth slide. So this is Mahabodhi temple, which is at a place called Bodh Gaya. And it is at the place where Buddha attained enlightenment. And the, this slide actually shows the front of the temple at Bodh Gaya. Uh, and let me know if you can have the next slide. So this uh, slide is behind the temple. And this, and this is where the spot where Buddha obtained enlightenment is. It is through the railings that you can see. Uh, and here we, we see some devotees on a pilgrimage uh, uh, at, at this spot. And Lavinia, if we can have the next slide. And this is the actual spot where Buddha uh, uh, obtained enlightenment. And uh, there you can see a tree in the corner and this is a, a Bodhi tree. It's not the original Bodhi tree, but it is said that it is related to the original Bodhi tree in the sense that cuttings from the original tree had been taken to Sri Lanka and then cuttings were brought back to India. So in that way, this tree is actually related to the original Bodhi tree. So for a period after his enlightenment, uh, Lavinia can actually take off the slide if, uh, now. For a, for a period after his enlightenment, the Buddha sat at the foot of the Bodhi tree, experiencing the bliss of liberation and reviewing his discovery. Some texts say this period was one week and some others say it was seven weeks. Uh, after this period, um, at first, you know, the Buddha thought his discovery was so profound that most people will fail to understand it. Uh, and he was at a loss as to what to do. And there, there is a mythological account in this story here, um, but I won't go through it now. Um, uh, but eventually he came to the realization that the five ascetics that he was with, you know, they had advanced on the spiritual path and, and Buddha realized that if he spoke about his discovery to the five ascetics, they will actually be able to understand his discovery. So he sought out the five ascetics at the deer park at, a play, at Isipatna, which in modern India is called Sarnath. It's uh, near Varanasi, in a uh, town called Varanasi. Now, when the five ascetics saw Buddha approaching them, they decided that they will only show normal courtesies to the Buddha and have nothing further to do with the Buddha because in their view, Buddha had lapsed in his search. However, in spite of this, they were drawn in by the Buddha's demeanor and they listened to the Buddha. And at first the Buddha taught them the middle way. The middle way is not to practice two extremes. One extreme is that of sensual indulgence and the other extreme is that of self-mortification. As Buddha realized, neither of these extremes led to him discovering the way out of suffering. Um, and again, you know, this, this points to, uh, to us as well. In our practice, we should not be clinging to these extremes. You know, if we are always going to be running after sensual desires, then 
it's quite possible that the practice will not come too much. And the other extreme, self-mortification, generally most people don't choose that path, but there are some who do. Um, but again, as Buddha discovered, self-mortification is not the answer. And in general, you know, what, what all this means is, you know, with Buddhist religion, we really don't have to do anything special. We don't have to go on top of a mountain. Um, you know, our daily life gives us enough food for practice. And all we need to do is practice in our daily life. Um, so that's what also what this middle way is, is saying. And um, in fact, uh, so, so the teaching is called the middle way. And in fact, the society's journal is actually named after that. It's called the middle way. So the Buddha discovered the middle way between the extremes led to calm and liberation. And the path of practice, which is the Noble Eightfold Path, which we will cover in a future talk, is this middle way. After this teaching of the middle way, the Buddha taught the five ascetics, the four noble truths. And again, we'll we will cover this and that forms the core of the Buddhist teaching. And so with these teachings of the middle way and the four noble truths, the Buddha set in motion the wheel of truth, the wheel of Dharma. Dharma is Buddha's teachings. The five ascetics that he had first taught to, they gained enlightenment and they became Buddha's first disciples. Uh, Lavinia, if you can have uh, the next slide. Yeah, so this is. Uh, Stupa Sarnath. So this is the place where Buddha taught his first teachings to the five ascetics. This stupa actually represents an inverted mound of earth, and usually it's relics of, in this case, Buddha, or in uh, other cases in Buddhist countries, you'll see stupas of uh, of a highly achieved monks. Uh, uh, you know, relics of, the, uh, of these people uh, uh, under the stupa. That's, uh, that's what it represents, actually. And uh, let me know if we can have the uh, next slide. And so this um, with Arupa uh, is in the museum at Sarnath. Uh, and it's a beautiful uh, Rupa, which which is showing Buddha teaching the four noble truths. So in all, Buddha's teaching career lasted 45 years and the Buddha passed away at the age of 80 in Pushinagar. Um, let me know if we can have the next slide. So this is the place, Kushinagar, where the Buddha passed away. So there's a stupa called Nirvana stupa, and there's a temple in, the, in front of it called the Nirvana temple. And uh, let me know if you can have the next slide. So this is a Buddha Rupa in the uh, temple, in the Nirvana temple, uh, depicting Buddha in the last stages of his life. Okay, uh, let me know, you can uh, take the slide off. So that's the um, bare bones of Buddha's life story. Now we'll discuss some of the features of Buddhism as a religion. So as I've said, Buddhism is the truth that was discovered by the Buddha and it gives the path that leads to that truth so that we can discover it for ourselves. Now, the first important point is that in Buddhism, there is no creator God who transcends his creatures and has power over them. Uh, so uh, if I can say, compare this to Christianity, 
Christianity has an idea of a God who created man. So in Buddhism, there is no such creator God as such. Rather than that, in Buddhism, there is a natural law that is seen to be operating. And this is the law that we discover as we pro uh, progress through the path as to how the true reality actually functions. And when we are in harmony with that natural law, we put an end to the suffering. And when we are not in harmony with it, then that's when we suffer. So it's, it's uh, so Buddha's, um, it's so in Buddhism, there is no God as such. The, our guide are the teachings themselves and, and our practice and our understanding of the teachings. This round of suffering that we as human beings are enmeshed in is called samsara in Sanskrit. So Sanskrit is one of the two languages where Buddhist uh, doctr uh, doctrine is written. Um, so Sanskrit is one of the languages and the other language is Pali. Now, so samsara is a Sanskrit word, which means basically a mundane life of suffering. And it is our ignorance of the way things really are that we are enmeshed in samsara. We somehow misconstrue what true reality is. And it is that that is causing us suffering. And becoming free of that enmeshment is called nirvana, which means enlightenment. And this is summarized in Buddha's words, suffering I teach and the way out of suffering. Now, although Buddhism does not have a creator God, it is still a religion because it requires us to lay down our narrow ways of seeing and behaving it requires us to lay down our all enveloping interest in ourselves, in I and me for something that is much greater. And that act of laying myself down is a religious act. So it is actually a religion. In Buddhism, no one, not even the Buddha, can grant us deliverance just by begging for it or by following rites and rituals blindly or by blind faith, just by having blind faith in Buddha. None of these things actually lead us to the real realization of the truth. To realize the truth, we have to walk the Buddha's way ourselves. And that is how we gain liberation. It is said that Buddha but points the way. We have to walk it ourselves. So what this implies is that the effort has to be put in by each one of us individually. And indeed, effort and energy are requirements for following the path. So when we cover the Noble Eightfold Path, we will see that one of the factors is the effort. Um, and in uh, the parameters, we will see that it's the energy that, that's required for, for following the path. So as I said, Buddhism does not require blind faith. There is no compulsion, there is no coercion in Buddhism. Buddhism calls for us to investigate the teachings for ourselves. We take a small step, and see it and test it. If the small step that we've taken works, if we can see something materializing out of it, then we can take another step. And Buddha said, 
that as the wise test gold by burning, by cutting and by rubbing it on a touchstone, so are you to accept my words after examining them and not merely out of regard for me. So just to emphasize this point, um, I will give a dialogue between Buddha and his disciples. So the Buddha, after he had given a teaching uh, to the disciples, asked the disciples, if now knowing this and preserving this, that's the teaching, if now knowing this and preserving this, would you say we honor our master and through respect for him, we respect what he teaches? And the disciples replied to Buddha, no, Lord. So the Buddha asked them, that which you affirm, O disciples, is it not only that which you yourselves have recognized, seen, and grasped? Yes, Lord, said the disciples. And I'll just read out something from one of the texts that I recommended, which is Piyadasi's uh, Buddha's ancient path. So Piyadasi says, the Buddha never interfered with another man's freedom of thought. For freedom of thought is the birthright of every individual. It is wrong to force someone out of the way of life which accords with his outlook and character, with his spiritual inclination and tendencies. Compulsion in every form is bad. It is coercion of the blackest kind to make a man swallow beliefs for which he has no relish. Such forced feeding cannot be good for anybody anywhere. So Piyadasi makes it quite clear that there is no compulsion, no coercion in Buddhism. So in Buddhism, you never see forced conversions or proselytizing. And Buddha also denounced adherence to unprofitable rites and rituals and superstitions. Now, the next point I want to make about Buddhism is a very important one. Buddha's way cannot be understood by mere intellectual study alone. And we've seen that in Buddha's life story where um, the prince would have known about death, but it was quite another thing coming face to face with death. So, you know, in, we can st study things intellectually, but till we actually come across those things face to face in life, that's when they become alive. So Buddha's way cannot just be understood simply by reading books, for example. And, you know, in the West, we are very intellectual, and we believe that if only something is explained to me properly, if we read enough books, we will come to understand Buddhism. I can say with fair certainty that Buddha's insight can never be realized by book learning only. Study and practice have to balance each other for true insight to arise. So study is important, but it's not exclusive. The other thing about the Buddhist religion, uh, which a lot of people misunderstand, um, is in Buddha's teaching, there is no attempt that is made to probe into metaphysical questions. You know, for example, uh, you know, where, when did the universe come into existence? Is it finite? Is it infinite? Um, you know, questions like that. The solution to these metaphysical questions will not free man suffering. And so that is why Buddha hesitated to answer any questions that were metaphysical. Buddha's only concern with the Buddhist teaching is to explain suffering and the way out of suffering. That's 
that's the, that's the main concern of Buddhism. You know, we might actually get insight uh, about, you know, life and so, some greater things. You know, we might be able to relate it to science or whatever, but these, this, that's all incidental. It's all to do with suffering and the way out of suffering. So as I've said that there are two main languages of Buddhism, there is Sanskrit and Pali. Now, Buddhism, uh, there are two main forms of Buddhist, Buddhism, uh, uh, or, or if I can put, put it to this way, two major schools of Buddhism uh, existing today. Uh, one is called Theravada Buddhism. Um, so when Buddhism spread from India, it went southward. Uh, so it, it went to Sri Lanka, and then it went on to Burma, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, and South Vietnam. So this southern route that Buddhism took is actually Theravada school. Buddhism also spread northwards from India, and it spread northwards, took it to Tibet, Mongolia, China, Korea, Japan, and North Vietnam. So that form of Buddhism that, uh, that spread northwards is called Mahayana Buddhism. Our first five lessons are mainly taken from Theravada Buddhism. And Mahayana Buddhism is actually a further development from Theravada Buddhism. And that will be our sixth lesson where we will cover in very brief outline uh, what Mahayana Buddhism is. So, I said, so as I said, there are two languages of Buddhism. The, uh, Theravada, the Theravada Buddhism is mainly uh, written in the Pali Canon and the Mahayana scriptures were originally in Sanskrit language, but Sanskrit um, writings have now been lost and we have the Mahayana doctrine mainly from their spread through Tibet uh, and China and onwards from there. Um, so that brings us to the end of this uh, lesson. Um, so, we, uh, we, we can now have an opportunity for discussion questions, and we, we can do it for one, in one of two ways. Um, um, either you can unmute yourself and ask the question if you wish to, or you can direct the question in chat to Lavinia, or just put it out down in chat, and Lavinia will compile the questions and read out the questions to me if you have any questions. Thank you very much, Rohit. So we already have a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah. So the first one is quite a long question. Um, and he's asking, I am familiar with the teachings, but what really helped me uh, understand oneness was praying five times a day and pondering ayats in the Quran like koans. I'm sure if I would have just been a Buddhist, I would have come to the same conclusions and I would probably have what I wanted out of life right now. But no one can argue with uh, what if, and this is it. I've had awakenings before, I really even started to meditate and I understand anything is possible. I was very interested in the Vajrayana teachings of letting go and using bad experiences and anger as the path to liberation. Can you help me with these or suggest any books? Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> thank you for that question. Uh, what I would say, um, um, so you know, in Buddhism, uh, there are various traditions uh, or, you know, so Buddhism, uh, as I say, it spreads southwards and you know, the way it's practiced in different countries has actually changed. Um, and uh, so uh, southwards, it went to Sri Lanka, Burma, uh, 
Cambodia. And there are differences uh, as to how it's practiced, what's emphasized. And also it went northwards to Tibet, uh, China, Mongolia, uh, where it looks radically different. And um, so what you're referring to is from Tibetan Buddhism, the Vajrayana teachings is from Tibetan Buddhism. Now, I myself uh, have followed Zen uh, Buddhism. Now, the, you know, the difficulty about following Buddhism generally is it's, it's really, um, actually doesn't lead to uh, proper um, uh, real insight. So we, uh, one has to pick a particular path and follow it right to the end. So, you know, I'm practicing Zen Buddhism and, you know, so that's what I practiced uh, and I, I haven't practiced Tibetan Buddhism and uh, therefore I'm afraid I can't answer your question. However, um, you know, if you, if you like to know more about Tibetan Buddhism, you know, there are classes in Tibetan Buddhism that the society holds. And if you're on the mailing list or if you go to the website, you will find out about these classes. And if you ask one of the Tibetan teachers, then you know, I'm sure they will be able to answer your question. Thank you very much, Rohit. So the next question is asking, what is the thing greater than oneself that Buddhists seek, which makes it a religion? Can't a utilitarian be a Buddhist, provided they understand that decreasing pain is the best way to increase lasting pleasure of the highest order. Okay, can you read that out again, please? Sure. What is the thing greater than oneself that Buddhists seek, which makes it a religion? Can't a utilitarian person be a Buddhist, provided they understand that decreasing pain is the best way to increase lasting pleasure of the highest order. Uh, okay, so what is the uh, thing about Buddhism that gives us the liberation? That, uh, as I say, it's, um, so it is something, first of all, the first thing to be said about it is that it's something that can never be understood intellectually. You know, uh, what the Buddha's insight is not something that can be understood intellectually and it's not, it's not even, it cannot even be expressed intellectually. So it cannot be expressed in words. So, you know, in Buddhism, there's vast literature and you will never ever find in there description of what enlightenment is actually because it is something that has to be experienced for oneself. And uh, what that experience shows us is that the way we, we view the world, there is something flawed about it. The world is an ever, uh, the, the true reality is ever flowing, it is, uh, so one way of saying that is, you cannot pinpoint to something and say that this is it, because by, by pinpointing it to an object or an idea or something, then you have made it into something concrete. Whereas the very core of that understanding is that nothing concrete, nothing permanent exists. And, and that is why, in fact, you, we cannot understand uh, the, uh, that truth uh, uh, intellectually, uh, because if you, go, if you were going to uh, express it intellectually, then we would be having concrete ideas, you know, we, we would have concepts, and the truth goes beyond, tr beyond concepts, beyond objects. Um, so, uh, so it, um, it it, it cannot be uh, understood intellectually. Now, um, so that, so what that is, if there is no God, what, what is it? What it is, is that understanding arising in us and us realizing that our ordinary way of looking at things was somehow flowed. And we realize how it was flowed. 
and we do not indulge in that flawed seeing. Now, um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by utilitarian um, uh, practice, but, uh, you know, by, you, you say, so by decreasing pain, will you, you, will you come to the realization? I mean, you know, um, it is, it is about, uh, uh, about suffering for uh, decreasing suffering, but unfortunately the answer is not simply uh, derived by saying, you know, I will decide to suffer less. Um, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm not certain that just by saying I will suffer less, uh, you will find the answer. It's just a graduated practice. Perhaps it goes in a roundabout way, um, but it eventually brings us to the understanding of that truth, that truth that cannot be expressed in words. And once we, once we know it, then we can, uh, we can start to live by it. In that way, the suffering will get reduced because we know that our suffering was, was caused by that flawed understanding um, that, that we had. And we, we, we start looking at it in a new light. We start looking at reality in a new light. Sorry, it's a long-winded way of explaining it, but I hope that answers the question. I mean, whoever asked the question, if you want to unmute yourself and if you, if you want to ask any more, you, you're welcome to. Uh, it was me, but I won't keep everyone else uh, here longer. The, there can be another time. I plan on sticking around for a while. So okay. um, and that right. other question is fine. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so, Lavinia? Yes. So we've got quite a few questions in the chat. And the next one is from Jeff, who's asking, is there one book to refer to, like the Bible or the Quran, that I can keep going to for guidance? Uh, so, um, uh, yeah, so the, the best um, source would be Buddha's discourses. If you want to read um, the actual uh, doctrine, it'd be Buddha's discourses. And um, uh, I'm sure if you email the librarian, uh, Lavinia, uh, she, uh, she can, uh, uh, eventually, I mean, I'm not saying today, if, if you emailed her, she would be able to point out uh, uh, Buddha's discourses. They are, uh, they've been translated into English. Uh, so, uh, uh, so there are, um, you know, his long sayings, uh, medium length ones, etc. And uh, those book, Pali books translated into English uh, would be the best source if you want to go to the, or uh, like the original Buddha's words, so to speak. And also one very nice um, uh, thing is Dhammapada, which, which are verses, which is, you know, they're, they're nice verses to go and, you know, look at, look at them from time to time. So it's called the Dhammapada. And again, um, if you email Lavinia, uh, she can eventually answer, uh, let you know what, you, you know, how you can get hold of those. If you are a member, you, you can actually borrow books from the library as well. Thank you so much, Rohit. Um, so the next question is from Mahla, who's asking, can you recommend any authentic documentaries regarding Buddha's life and journey? So um, there's nothing that comes to my mind straight away, but you know, these days, if you went to YouTube and just search for Buddha's life story, I'm certain that you will find various accounts. Uh, but, you know, there's nothing that I've looked at recently that springs, springs to mind, unfortunately. Thanks a lot, Rohit. Do we have time for a few more questions? Uh, yes, yes. So, uh, you know, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, the talks are supposed to be one hour and uh, so, you know, people, if they want to, you know, tune off, they're welcome to. But if, if you want to listen to the questions and answers, you know, you can, you know, stay on. Uh, so, uh, as I say, you know, uh, it's one hour, but we'll carry on uh, till we can answer a few more questions. 
That's great. Thanks a lot. So the next question I have is from Christina, who's asking if you could please repeat the different names Buddha was addressed by and the reasons for why he was addressed in different ways. Thanks. Okay. So when, um, when he was born, the, the name he was given was Siddharth and his family name was Gautam. So his full name when he was born as a child would be Prince Siddharth Gautam because he was a prince at that time. So he was Prince Siddharth Gautam. The other term that I referred to was Bodhisattva. So this term Bodhisattva is not just simply uh, uh, aimed at Buddha before his enlighten enlightenment, when he was seeking enlightenment. It can apply to any one of us, you know, if we, if we are seeking for enlightenment and, we, and if we are following the path of practice. Uh, so, the, so that the term is used generally and, and, and more generally it's used uh, um, uh, in what uh, there are bodhisattvas who are, again, uh, you know, you, we can say mythological beings who represent certain um, characteristics, psychological characteristics perhaps, um, of Buddhism. Uh, so those are bodhisattvas. So, so the term bodhisattva is much wider than re referring to Buddha. So there's Prince Siddharth Gautam, there's bodhisattva, and then uh, when he became enlightened, then he's Buddha. Buddha means the enlightened one. Okay, Lavinia. Thanks so much. All right. So the next question is from Pete. Uh, who's asking, if Buddhism cannot be understood by study alone, what are the other ways to understand it? Are you referring to meditation? Many thanks. Yeah, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, so I'm referring to practice in general, and meditation is just one part of it. So practicing uh, Buddhism means actually... Uh, doing certain things, uh, and, and we will actually cover what the path of practice is, so we will know what is required in the practice. Um, so, uh, and, and uh, the other thing to say about practice is the practice should be done uh, in basically with a traditional teacher, you know, be it Theravada teacher, be it a Mahayana, be it a Tibetan, but uh, there should be a teacher to guide us because some of the things are very difficult to understand. So. So when I talk about practice, really, I, I mean practice under a teacher. Um, and so, so uh, as to what that involves, uh, we'll, we will cover that in future talks. But as far as meditation is concerned, that is one aspect of the practice. Some people think that meditation is the only part of Buddhist practice. Uh, that is not true. It's just one part of it. And in fact, you cannot... Buddhism doesn't result in, uh, sorry, uh, meditation doesn't result in much if uh, meditation is the only thing you're practicing. It's got to be um, supplemented by all the other factors of, of the path of practice. So yes, practicing, practicing under, under a teacher uh, and, um, um, uh, and yeah, and meditation as well. Uh, they all uh, lead to, the, to that understanding. Uh, and I will talk in the last talk about how to go about finding a teacher, uh, you know, how to go on from, from the Introducing Buddhism course uh, so that we can actually practice. Thank you, Lavinia. Thanks a lot for our hit. The next question is from Victoria, who's asking, after having studied Buddhism for as long as you have, do you still experience suffering? Yeah, now, the answer to that is yes. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, um, uh, but I would say that um, um, uh, there are many, many things that would have overwhelmed me, uh, which don't overwhelm me, um, because I understand, you know, where they're coming from, what they are. Uh, but, uh, but the reason why I say that um, uh, there is still suffering is because of a theory of karma that we will 
cover. And theory, the theory of karma says that um, unskillful things that we've done in the past, um, and, and you know, there's, there's unskill, unskillful things may not, may not be gross things. It might just be hankering after something, you know, desiring something or get, or having, or getting angry or getting anxious, uh, you know, all those sort of things. You know, if those have been our characteristics that have been there in the past, then they lay down seeds within our being, which then mature at some time in suffering. So even after enlightenment, those seeds have to be worked through. But what happens is when that arises, there is an understanding of why it is arising and it's not uh, indulged in anymore, whether it's anger or whether it's anxiety or whether it's wanting something. Uh, you know, once we understand true reality, we, we can see the arising of that energy within us. And before we get carried away by it, before it can lay new seeds for suffering in the future, we, we, um, uh, we just contain that energy. And by containing that energy, we understand it more. We, we develop an intimate relationship with what it is. It is actually a life force and we come to understand it more. And, and, we, and that way, the, our suffering gets reduced over time. But as I say, you know, our karmic seeds have been laid in the past. In fact, classically, they've been laid since time immemorial in our past lives as well. And all those have to be worked through. Uh, so whoever asked that question, does that help? Does it answer it? Uh, you can unmute yourself. If yes, you it does. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, Lavinia. Yes. So the next question from Isabella is asking, how do you go about choosing a certain Buddhist path like Zen? How okay. do you know which one is best suited for you? Yeah. And thanks for a great first lesson. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a very important question because, you know, I'm saying that we have to practice and I'm saying the only way to practice really is to follow a genuine traditional path. Uh, and I will be going through all this uh, in the last uh, talk. So, you know, this means that we would have to choose one of the traditions of Zen that we want to follow. Uh, a lot of people chop and change, you know, they go to a bit of Theravada, a bit of Tibetan, a bit of Zen, and then try to sort of make a mishmash for themselves, you know, which they think suits them. But actually, I don't think um, that leads to much. Uh, 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 far better is to actually follow a traditional path that has been shown to work over hundreds of years uh, and just to follow that. So, so your question is very important because, you know, we have to follow one particular tradition. And uh, well, the last, in the last lesson, I will actually cover that. So if we can leave it till then, um, till then what I'm teaching uh, or covering in these talks will be general theory, theory that applies to all schools really. Uh, so, uh, so, uh, so, so for the course, you, you do not need to have chosen a particular tradition uh, but I will go into it, you know, for the practice you would need to and how you go about it. Uh, I'll, I will cover that in the last lesson. Thank you, Lavinia. Thanks so much, Rohit. Um, all right. So the next question is from Diana, who's mm -hmm. asking, if you have no knowledge of the teachings, would you recommend to start with living Buddhism other than this course, of course? Sorry, say that again? Um, if you have no knowledge of the teachings, no. would you recommend to start with living Buddhism? Okay. Uh, okay. So yes, living Buddhism is a very readable book. So I would definitely re recommend reading that uh, uh, if that's the first book on Buddhism that you're reading. But also, as I said, you know, the notes, my, my own notes are available to you. So 
uh, or will be available to you if you're registered for the course, uh, uh, they should be put uh, uh, um, where they're accessible after every talk. Uh, so that will actually give you the basics that you know I've talked about. Uh, so that will cover the basics, but definitely Living Buddhism is a very readable book. It'd be a good book to read to start with. Uh, and then after that, what the Buddha taught is also a very readable book as well. All right, shall I ask the next question, Rohit? Yeah. All right. Uh, this question is from Brittany, who's asking, are there any other beings that have reached Buddha's level of enlightenment? Is there only one Buddha? No, I mean, I, I would say, you know, there would be countless people who have realized the truth uh, and not necessarily through Buddhism because, you know, what Buddha's teachings are, are really, no, at the end of the day, all religions would come to that point. Uh, so someone who's highly attained in whatever religion will come to, the, to a similar uh, or same realization, really. So, uh, uh, you know, there would be countless beings who would have reached the same level as Buddha. And um, also, um, you know, traditionally or classically in Buddhist uh, literature, it is said that there were previous Buddhas before Buddha of our time, and that there will be future Buddhas as well. So, you know, there have been Buddhas prior to Buddha of our time, who, who in sort of classical Buddhist literature would have reached that understanding and there'll be Buddhas in future who can reach that understanding. And actually, you know, that understanding is actually available to each and every one of us. It's not something, you know, so, uh, so far out that, you know, it's beyond us. It is accessible to each and every one of us. Uh, uh, and, and, and Buddha himself said, you know, what I teach, each person has the power and the wisdom to understand what I say. So, you know, it could be understood by, understood by each one of us, but, you know, we have to follow the path of practice and, and, and also have the intellectual understanding as well. So study and practice, in other words, um, for us to, to come to that understanding. Thank you, Lavinia. <clears throat> so much the next question is from david who's asking if you could please explain again what happened at the body tree uh he says i feel i missed the key insight thanks okay in, in fact I, I did not actually talk about the insight uh and uh, because uh as i say enlightenment is not something that uh, uh, that can be described so um Really, what, what I said was the Buddha sat cross-legged in meditation under the, un, under the uh, uh, Bodhi tree, and he went into successive higher and higher stages of meditation, and then profound insights opened up. So that is actually how it works, that you know we do the practice, we have to do our bit, and the insights open up themselves. We can't force them. We can't do anything about that. And, and then, you know, that's what I said that, you know, the profound insights opened up. And, but I did not say what those insights were because they can't be described. But you, you will get inkling of, of that as we get, go along. But uh, yeah, that's all I'd said. So, so he, those insights that opened up in Buddha made him understand why we suffer. And he also found that basically knowing that truth, uh, having that insight about that truth will release us from that suffering. Thank you, thank, Lavinia. Thank you so much, Rohit. Um, all right, we have another question here. Um, which is asking, my mom passed away last year and I am struggling to feel like her spirit is around me as my beliefs are Buddhist and hers was Christianity. So I feel like she's lost and I don't know how to grieve. 
Have you got any advice? Oh, well, I'm really sorry to hear that. Um, uh, so this is one of life's suffering. Um, you know, one uh, thing I can say, perhaps, uh, you know, people find different ways. Uh, but uh, yes, I mean, you're right that in Buddhism, you know, we do not have like um, a tomb or a graveyard that we can visit because, you know, bodies are cremated. Uh, and so in Buddhism, you know, you, you, there is not that, that is not available. Um, what is available to us is remembrance of that person and gratitude for that life having been there. So, you know, you can contemplate in the mornings, for example, when you get up or when you do your meditation, spend five or 10 minutes quietly, just pondering the presence that you had, you know, you, you know, and, and, you know, if there is, you know, if there is gratitude for that presence, having been in your life, feel that gratitude and, and you know, remember the qualities that she had um, and, and, you know, re remembrance in that way with the gratitude will, I hope, help you. Um, but, you know, this is just one of many ways that people, you know, find. But um, also in general, in Buddhism, you know, just gratitude that what life provides us with it is a valuable part of the practice. And, uh, uh, and you know, um, we see people being born, people dying, and that itself is a flawed thing. Uh, the, the life, the life force that is there, that life force is still, is still around us. That is, that is the true reality. And that life force isn't separate between you and me and everyone else. It, it, is, it, is, it is there. And that is the understanding that we come to. That is, uh, that is the energy out of which uh, everything comes out. And that's the energy to which everything goes back. And it is that very same energy that when we understand it is released to the suffering. But when that energy comes in conjunction with our float thing, that is when we have um, our wild fences and you know, that's when we go astray. But the whole Buddhist teaching is coming, is transformation of that energy. And you know, I hope that by, by remembering your mother with gratitude in quiet remembrance, uh, you will, you know, find some comfort. Um, does it help whoever asked the question? If you want to say, I mean, if you don't, that's fine. Yes, yeah, that was me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Does, uh, sorry, is that Tanya? Tanya? It is, does, yeah. Uh, is it, does that help? Uh, you know, yeah, it, in, in yeah it does help. Yeah. yeah, it was just trying to come to terms with, obviously, different religions and... Yeah. I've been quite envious in a way that mum, my sister always says, oh, I feel like our mum's around, but no. I don't feel that. And I didn't know whether it was because we've got yeah. different beliefs. Yeah. Well, you know, that is also, you know, when she said they're around, that's, you know, uh, again, uh, her, her way of putting concepts and thoughts. Um, you know, the, uh, so, you know, that's her way of seeing and, uh, so you have to, as, as you have discovered, you know, have to find your own way. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you, you know, uh, when you do uh, remember your mother in gratitude, you know, if you, you can do it with folded hands, uh, you, you, you can kneel down and, you know, bow uh, in remembrance. Uh, I particularly find that that has helped me, um, you know, and that's what, that's why I'm saying that. But um, uh, if you're looking for presence, like your sister has found some presence, that presence is actually all around us. That is what life is actually. And, and that life is not separate between you and me and everyone. And your mother sort of lives on in that life. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, Lavinia, are there any more questions?
Yes, there are still quite a few questions actually. <laughs> So what we'll do, so, uh, well, I mean, it's, um, uh, it'll be eight o'clock soon. So we'll, we'll finish at eight, we'll cover what we can and hopefully, um, you know, people might have a chance to ask questions next time. Yeah? Of so course. Now, so you can, yeah, yeah, what's the next question? All right, the next question is asking, I have been drawn to Buddhism for a long time, but have been mocked and loathed out by others for this. I now have the confidence to start finding out more and reading and obviously joining this course. What advice do you have for someone who's completely new to this? Where to start, for example? Thanks. Okay. Um, good. Sorry, I missed out a couple of words right at the beginning. Can you repeat it? I have been drawn to Buddhism for a long time, but have been mocked and loathed at by others for this. Okay. I now have the confidence to start finding out more, reading and obviously joining this course. What advice do you have for someone who's completely new to this? Where to start, for example? Thanks. Yeah, and in fact, you know, this course is a good place to start because this course will give you the basic framework of Buddhism that we need to understand the religion. So this is a good place to start. And then, uh, uh, as I say, uh, then to carry on after this course is finished, you would need to find somewhere where you can actually practice rather than just simply study. And as I said, um, I will cover that uh, in the last talk of this lesson. So you, hopefully you can carry on from there. So I, I think if you, you know, Having started with this course, if you carry on with this course, that's, that's a good beginning and uh, it will lead you to um, the practice. And if you are in London, uh, then, you know, uh, once the courses start um, in person at the society, you can go to the sessions there with whatever tradition you choose to follow. So that it will all come in place. But, you know, this basic framework that we need with this course, Introducing Buddhism, is a good place to start and it will it'll take you to the next stage uh, for, for practice. That was me, lovely, thank you. Okay, good. Thanks a lot, Rohit. And incidentally, you know, you said you were mocked at or, you know, um, you should, you know, that's not something that, uh, you say you've got the confidence now, so it does, it, it's, you know, besides the point now, but really, you know, uh, you, you know what interests you what doesn't interest you you know in some way is up to you really it, it should not be dictated to by other people sorry you're you're you're, uh, you're, you're <laughs> sorry you're, yeah. um yeah i have i've found that confidence now before i was you know i've talked about it and people oh, don't be stupid you know and yeah. laughing at me when i've mentioned it so yeah. i'm just ignoring all that now and i'm focusing on me and looking after me and do what i want to do so starting here so it's all good thank you for everything it's been great so far thank you okay good okay Cheers. okay so we'll have one more question and then we'll end it for today all right so the last question for today um is it possible that someone reaches the level of buddha and doesn't know it or will it be quite obvious to the person once they reach enlightenment um I would say it would be obvious. Uh, I mean, in some ways, you know, uh, our animal brethren are actually living that life, but they do not have the understanding or the uh, intellectual capacity for that understanding. So that uh, intellectual capacity to understand it is part of it as well. So, if someone reaches that insight uh, and they are at the level of Buddha, then they should know because they will need, because they, they also need to know what the mundane world is and how other beings suffer. Buddhism is not just about ending our own suffering. Uh, you know, it is, uh, uh, particularly in Mahayana, it is to uh, assist all sentient beings. Uh, and you can only do that if you understand, you know, how other beings look at the world, you know, what they experience. And for all that, you cannot just be on a 
say, if I can put, put it this way, on a cloud nine, you being okay, uh, um, but you, you've got to know, you know how other people are as well, and that needs that understanding. Uh, so I think uh, you, you, it's not possible to be simply highly achieved without not knowing about it. Uh, uh, and that is why it is also said in Buddhism that Buddhists, you, you have to be born uh, as a human being to, uh, to uh, gain enlightenment. That's precisely why it is said, because we need that understanding. And uh, human beings have the capacity for that understanding. Okay, okay thank you very much. That brings thank us you. to the end of this lesson. Uh, so hopefully I'll see you next week. So I'll say goodbye. <laughs>